Good afternoon, everybody. I'm sorry for the delay. Um, the good news is we are, uh, Nowcast SA, who just does wonderful things for us, is streaming this, or at least recording it. Uh, so we need to get everything ready. They did this in record time, so I wanted to thank them for this. So this will be available for other people who can't make it today. I'm Francine Romero. I'm the Dean of the College of Public Policy at UTSA, and I just want to welcome you to our campus. Uh, we have lots of different things we're doing today, um, lots of different introductions. I just want to thank Evelyn Bonavita, who will be your host for most of the day. Evelyn is the program vice president for League of Women Voters. We do a lot of events in partnership with League of Women Voters, and they are wonderful. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you. Um, Evelyn will be introducing our panelists, but I did want to recognize Representative Larson uh, from the UTSA perspective, and we did want to mention and thank him that as county commissioner, uh, he was instrumental in approving $16.5 million for UTSA's new athletic complex, and also in helping UTSA become a voting site during our national elections, which is really important to us. Uh, I now want to introduce uh, just briefly two people who are representing another great partner of ours, the UTSA Student Government Association. Uh, so I want to introduce Hannah Beck, who is Legislative Affairs Director for Student Government Association, and she was also the founder of National Organization for Women on our campus. And Chris Stort, who is the Senator for College of Public Policy and also an executive senator for Student Government Association. Uh, we really feel that Proposition 6 is about young people and the future, so we want them to just briefly welcome you as well. So please welcome them. Hey, everybody. Um, so Hannah and I really feel that uh, water is an issue that youth should care about, and that's why I think this water uh, forum is really important. Um, so in 2011, uh, TCEQ said that 97% um, uh, of Texas was in what they would call extreme drought or worse. Um, so we are in a water crisis right now, uh, not only from our expanding consumption of drinking water, but also because of energy production, which requires large amounts of water. Um, we do have water issues, um, and this plan is you know, something, it's a step to really make sure that we're sustainable in the future on water. So we are also here, um, if you guys are interested in getting involved because we think that it's really an issue that young people should care about to register people to vote. So if you guys would like to get registered to vote, um, we have voter registration applications with us. We'll hang around a bit after the forum um, and we can come up and register people because basically water is something that's going to be a huge issue for us as we're moving forward and it's ultimately going to become our issue and our problem. Um, so we would just love to help you guys get involved if you're interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. And if you have a, if you have your question cards, just you know raise those and I'll come around and we'll get them. them. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Greg Forrest from SAWS. We thought we needed somebody to explain the proposition, and uh, he leapt to mind. He is the vice president for public affairs, and he's been with the San Antonio Water System for eight years. Greg. Thank you very much. Thank you, Evelyn. And I want to thank the League of Women Voters as well as the College of Public Policy for putting this on. It's a really uh, fine program, I think, that you guys will be witness to here today. And certainly the, the, the panelists that are on the panel today will be able to shed a lot of light on what's going on in Texas. Water is uh, very complex, has become a very complex issue. So all of your hard questions can be directed to the panelists, and I'll take the easy questions. Um, it, it, it comes then as no surprise then, since water has become so complex, that we have a very complex uh, uh, proposition, and the way that that proposition came about in the state legislature uh, was also complex. Um, and certainly Representative Larson can speak to that, uh, because he was directly involved, and his leadership uh, was part of what was required to get that uh, proposition on, passed as law and to uh, be put before the voters. And I also want to recognize Naomi Miller, who's here from the Speaker's office, Speaker Strauss's office, and we want to thank Speaker Strauss for his leadership as well. And, um, so let me just uh, briefly, I've been given five minutes, so I'm just briefly going to talk about how 
how the how the uh, Proposition Six came to be, and then uh, what it entails uh, in terms of what the voters are are voting on this November. And um, uh, I speak to you uh, not advocating one way or the other in terms of voting a yay or nay, because at San Antonio Water System, I'm not allowed to, to advocate one way or the other on this proposition. But hopefully, I can just give you the information you need to make an informed decision. A complex issue such as water ended up being a very complex issue to sort through at the state legislature. Normally, uh, when a bill becomes a law, it's one bill, but in this case, Proposition 6 came into being by the passage of three bills, three different bills. Um, the legislature had, uh, the House had already passed a state budget, and because it had already passed a state budget during the session, uh, when the bill to appropriate $2 billion to help fund water projects around the state of Texas came to the floor, uh, it wasn't able to get passed because constitutionally in Texas, you cannot exceed the budget cap. You can only appropriate as much money as you are projected to have in the state of Texas. So, um, so this two billion dollars uh, that their legislature was trying to pass to help fund state water projects uh, ended up having to be passed in a very funky way. And so, what happened was that in order to have two billion dollars in excess of the uh, state budget cap, uh, it had to be put to the voters, so to speak. Uh, as a proposition and a constitutional amendment. The voters had to actually have to actually amend the Constitution in order for this $2,000 to be put into account. So there were three bills passed. One bill created the account in which the money will sit. The second bill appropriated the $2 billion to go into that account. And the third bill, which was a Senate joint resolution, um, uh, requires the voters to actually approve the account that was created so the money can be put into that account. So the voters will be voting to actually create an account in which this $2 billion will sit in order to help fund um, water projects in the future. And of course, all this was complicated by Democrats and Republicans fighting at the legislature, and that's why all this had to, had to be uh, done in such a funny way, passage of three different bills. What this fund will do is it will provide communities the opportunity uh, to fund some of the water project, the projects that they've envisioned for their future. The state of Texas has a state water plan that is comprised of a hodgepodge of regional water plans. San Antonio sits in Region L, which is uh, probably 21 counties, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Region L has 21 counties, and Region L has formulated its water plan for its future, and any water project that's in that water plan is eligible for funding from this, uh, this money that's been set aside from the rainy day fund uh, to be able to help fund projects. The funding comes in the form of um, low interest loans, uh, subsidized loans, and the ability for local communities to be able to borrow money to pay for large capital projects at a lower rate than they otherwise would be able to do. So the state of Texas has put its backing behind these water projects by setting aside the $2 billion in order to help make the funding of water projects more affordable across the state. And so that's what voters will be voting on uh, this November, is to create the account where $2 billion can sit and be utilized by communities around the state to help fund the development of water projects. Hopefully I've done that justice. Hopefully I've not confused matters further. Um, but if you have any questions, uh, happy to take them now or we'll just get right into the panel discussion. Thank you all very much and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the panel. mention that since this is jointly sponsored by UTSA College of Public Policy and the League of Women Voters and also the Student Government Association, the main purpose is to provide information rather than to lobby or to advocate. But our panelists, I'm sure, have positions and certainly are free to advocate or not as they wish. So I'm going to introduce them. The first one is Linda Curtis. And I have somewhere I've got her short page. The reason I'm, it's sort of, yeah, here it is. 
she very kindly at the very last minute has agreed to substitute for Alyssa Bergen, who has laryngitis and can't even speak. So Linda is a leading spokesperson, analyst, and tactician for the Texas Independent Political Movement. Linda has a long history working in the independent movement from her early efforts gaining ba ballot access for the first woman and African American to get on the ballot in all 50 states to the Ross Perot founded Reform Party in the 1990s. Thank you for coming, Linda. Our next panelist is Jennifer Garver, who is the city manager of Uvalde. She has a Master of Science in Accounting and a BBA in Accounting and graduated summa cum laude in Honors Studies. She lived in San Antonio from 2004 to 2007 and then saw the light and returned to Uvalde where she became employed by the city in 2009 and as the finance director and in 2012 became the city manager. Thank you, Jennifer. And on my left here is Representative Lyle Larson, who is a lifelong resident of the San Antonio area. He went to school here, and he was first elected here in 1991 to the San Antonio City Council. District 10, which is my district, so I feel close to Lyle Larson. He was elected for two terms and as Bear County Commissioner Precinct 3 from 97 to 2008. In 2010, Mr. Larson was elected state representative for District 122. And he has a lot of credentials. He serves on the House Natural Resources Committee, the Cultural, Culture, Recreation, and Tourism Committee, vice chair of the local and consent calendars, and he's on the Transparency in the State Agency Operations Committee. So thank you for being here. Our final panelist, is Diane Wassenick, who is, I've crossed this out by mistake because I thought my magic marker, you could see through and you can't. So she is a program manager for the San Marcos River Foundation. She is the most active volunteer I can think of. She serves in, as a volunteer and board member for this org that organization and has for 17 years. She's on the steering committee for the Edwards Aquifer Recovery Implementation Plan. She's vice chair on the Bay Basin Stakeholder Committee working on SB3 stuff. She is on the Plum Creek Watershed Program Steering Committee, and she has recently become a member of the Regional Water Planning Group, and I know this because she took my place on the planning group and represents mm -hmm. the public. We want to welcome her. To She's also grew up on the Gulf Coast in Matagorda and Wharton counties. Now we've told these panelists that they can start off with this question. What do you think will be the crucial impact of this proposition if it passes and what may be some of the unknowns associated with it? Should we start with you, Diane? Okay. I have to confess to begin with that I uh, look to Ken Kramer of the Lone Star Sierra Club for advice on water issues at the legislature because Ken knows more, has more stored in his pinky finger than I'll know my entire life about the legislature. And uh, Ken's position, and after much thought, my position, is that this is a very important proposition to pass. We obviously have needed water projects to serve the needs of many communities across Texas for a long time. We have no time to waste, as we're finding out with the drought. But there are many stipulations and points within that bill that are going to ensure that the proper prioritization is done by the regional water groups, that 20% of water uh, money will go for water conservation and reuse, no less than 20%, and no less than 10% will go for rural and agricultural projects. Um, there are stipulations about all kinds of ways that utilities will be evaluated and water conservation will be high on the list of points that people can get. So. 
I feel that it's an important proposition for us to support for those reasons, and I do think that it will move us forward if we prioritize projects and look at water conservation first because it's the cheapest water. Well, I've traveled all over the state and have seen the condition uh, of our groundwater and our surface water. Uh, if you look at our surface water inventories, uh, they are equivalent to what we had in 1990. Uh, we've got unprecedented groundwater depletions that are taking place because of the pressure of population centers, ag use, and our industrial base. If you look at uh, in the 1950s, the historic drought that has gained a lot of notoriety across the state, we are in worse condition now than we were. And it's a compounding factor. If you look, we had 8 million people. We got 25 million now. Uh, our industrial base and our ag use is up three to four times what it was uh, in, in the 1950s. So we have to do something. We've, we've planned for the last 30 years, and uh, we haven't built a lot. And uh, now it's getting to a point because of the condition uh, uh, on the landscape, both in, in surface and in groundwater, there's a lot of innovative projects. Uh, I, I agree uh, that we've got to continue to, to pursue reuse uh, and conservation. That is a key. That's the cheapest water that we have available. Uh, but there's also a lot of innovative strategies in, in desalinating uh, over 3 billion acre feet of water that's under the good water. Uh, but it, it's going to take uh, some initiative uh, by uh, the public utilities, uh, the river authorities, and the state. All of them have asked for some assistance. What this proposition does uh, it, uh, simply allows folks that don't have AAA rating or AA rating to access funds uh, to, so they can start building these projects. The average size of the project in this proposition will be about $25 million. Uh, if you look at the 45 communities today that have less than 180 days of water, they have to either uh, drill a well, build a pipeline, uh, or start working uh, towards a strategy. Those folks need this money immediately. Uh, and I'll give you some uh, communities. I know that Jennifer represents one that's less than 70 miles uh, from the city limits of San Antonio, Uvalde County. Uh, they've got less than 45 days of water left. Elsa, Raymondville, down in the valley, they have less than 45 days of water left. Spur, out in West Texas, they have less than 45 days. Uh, Spicewood Beach, uh, which is uh, within 30 miles of the, uh, of the capital of the state of Texas, has less than 45 days of water left. So to say that we shouldn't build anything, uh, what do you tell the folks that live in those communities? Uh, the, the low interest loans is one aspect of it. The other is a deferral. Uh, so if somebody wants to build a pipeline and bring it from an adjacent community uh, or rework a well or, or drill another well, uh, what the, the state will do is loan the money to them on a deferred basis and then they can start paying it back once they start gaining revenue uh, from whatever that water source is that they're putting together. So. I think uh, if we don't do anything, uh, then the perception, and it's already happened because we've got communities that have run out of water, uh, that uh, we're, we're drying up as a state, people are simply not going to bring their jobs to the state of Texas. I mean, uh, there's, uh, there's a perception that uh, already that we've got communities in West Texas and South Texas that could not sustain a manufacturing uh, facility because they don't have firm yields of water. Um, so I think there's a lot of innovative strategies that we can deploy to work on this. This money is not going to be granted. This money will be loaned. So the corpus will be intact in 30 years in receivables or will actually have the money in hand to continue to perpetuate the revolving loan. Uh, so there's a lot of misperceptions that this money would be handed out. It has to be in the state water plan. You have the 16 regions, uh, so it's not going to be set up where a state agency can hand this money out uh, without having it fully vetted at the local level. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of positives to, to, to actually addressing some of the projects that need to be built uh, in the state for our future. I wasn't trying to stop you. I just wanted to show everybody this is the latest state water plan. So if you want to come and look at it. on after the internet. You can click uh -huh, the Yeah, it's on both. 
you can see it's not the smallest document that there ever was. Jennifer. Well, I'm afraid y'all, it's going to sound like you're hearing the same thing over and over because, I, I mean, we're obviously, we have very, we really are on the same page about this Proposition 6. Um, I'm from Uvalde, and yes, we are. We are in a stage of extreme drought. We are in stage five. So for those of y'all in San Antonio, I think you're in stage two. Is that correct? Yeah, we're in five. So if that is, oh, did y'all move to three? Sorry about that. So we're in stage five. Um, and so this is a 44% cutback on our pumping that's mandated by the EA, and that is our only source of water right now. And this is, this is a huge financial dilemma for us. Um, we're a big agricultural area, so a lot of the food that you're buying in HEB is coming from our area. We grow cabbage and onions and corn, and, and then we also have a lot of growers of cotton, so a lot of fiber is coming from our area. If we don't have water, we can't continue to supply you with the food and fiber that you need here in you know, the metropolitan areas. So the big impact of Proposition 6 is the funding. You know, little towns, I have 16,000 people. I don't have the same access to capital that the metropolitan areas have. So this is, this, these low cost loans, this access to the capital, that's the key. And that's what we need to be able to develop these, these water solutions for the future. And you know, economic development, that's a big buzzword, you hear it all the time. We want to grow too. And that's, that is the issue. You cannot grow if you don't have access to water. And not just water, but affordable water. If we are the highest cost water, you know, people are, when, this, when the scouts come, that's one of the things they look at. They look at what land is available, what utilities are available, they look at costs. So if they come and look at our pricing and it's not feasible to them, well, they're going to take that job and they're going to go somewhere else. And we want it to come to us. Now, there are some unknowns. I mean, the 10% for rural communities was thrown out, and, and I'm glad that that 10% is in there. Is it enough? You know, I, obviously I'm very pro rural communities. I went home on purpose. I'm raising my children there on purpose, and I want them to come home and have dogs and bring grandchildren to the valley. So, you know, is 10% is enough of the allocation? I sure hope so. And then also, if you look at, at, at the factors that are being kind of thrown out there, as criteria for the loans of these monies. It's um, number of people served. Well, I don't have a lot of people to serve, but I feel like my people are really important. Um, urgency of the project. Ability of local and regional sponsors to support the project. Okay, support equals money. Always does in grant terminology. I don't have as much money as the metropolitan communities do. So, you know, these things just for me, they throw up a little bit of red flags because I'm like, well, are we going to be able to get our foot in the door as a little bitty community of 16,000 people? I only have 30,000 people in my whole county. So even if all 30,000 of us work together, is there enough of us to get access to this capital? I sure hope so. Um, and then also, this funding, even if it's passed, which I, you know, obviously I have a strong feeling and I think we need to pass this for the future. But even if it's passed this year, funds aren't going to be available until 2015 in the earliest. Well, I'm on the list of less than 45 days of water, so I can't wait till 2015. We have to start solving our problems now. And I know that there are other communities in the same situation. So we do have to figure out how we get from 2013 to 2015, even if this proposition passes. Thank you. I don't mean to rain on your parade. <laughs> <laughs> I'm opposed to Proposition 6. I'm, I'm the one lone voice. But, uh, but I seriously, I represent uh, a lot of, a, a very strange and weird coalition of people, from the Green Party progressives to Tea Party hardcore conservatives, and, uh, and the militant moderates, you know, from the old Perot movement, those that are still alive uh, today. And we are opposed to this for a, a, a variety of reasons. I'll try to get through them real quick. But um, I definitely feel what you're talking about from the other perspective, uh, the last speaker, because I live in an area where we have a, a, um, a so-called prolific aquifer, uh, Lee County and Bastrop, where every year or two we have water marketers and speculators coming in to try to raid the aquifer so they can make a, a big, fast buck moving it to the growth corridor. And let me tell you, the Lee County landowners and those of us who live in Bastrop, I'm just a, a lowly rate payer. We're not opposed to sharing water. In fact, our, our Lost Pines district just voted to, to uh, give some water to a four-star real estate group, which is a real estate giant. Um, and they are not 
Four Star is not happy with the 12,000 acre feet we gave them because they want 45,000 acre feet because they're in the business of moving water and making a very big profit off of moving water. And if it, if it endangers landowners and an ecological area, so be it. So that's kind of where we're coming from. And what is remarkable to me is that no one wants to talk about the fact that we passed $6 billion in bonding authority for the, the revolving water bank in 2011. Does anybody remember voting on that? You don't, because these things are not well explained. A lot of voters don't really completely understand what they're voting on when they go vote on bond measures. A lot of people do try. But I'm going to try to tell you that there is not a funding crisis. There is a water crisis in Texas, to be sure. And it has to do, in our view, with the fact that some municipalities are not doing it right. San Antonio happens to be doing it right. Dallas, one of the biggest water hogs in the state, is going after flooding an agricultural region to its northeast to put in that Marvin Nichols uh, reservoir, and the farmers up there bought it off for 10 years. They grow food there. So what is happening in water policy in Texas today is that we're having to make some very hard choices. Do we want to flood agricultural areas? Do we like our food shipped in from somewhere else? Do we think that aquifers should be preserved, that they should not be drained dry for almighty growth? These are very hard questions, and I'll tell you the the, one of the most fundamental reasons why you all should be opposed to this six billion, the two billion that they're asking for now, since they haven't touched a dime of the six billion they got in 2011, is that our view on this is it's quicker, faster money for the people who run the show at the top of the state. Because the, one of the fundamental things that happened when they passed this legislation is they reorganized the Texas Water Development Board from six appointees of the governors, and we, we didn't love the Texas Water Development Board. Okay? We've been fighting them for years to try to hold on to our water in Bashrock. But we went from bad to worse. We have three paid appointees directly by the governor. Two of them came out of his office and or were political appointees. And they are going to make the decisions about these 526 projects around the state and which ones get prioritized. So last thing I want to share with you is in is that there is no guarantee for conservation and rural, as we read it. And I'm not an attorney, but I had a very astute attorney read the language. We watched the debate on the House floor, which you all can watch. You can go to our website at independenttexans.com and click on the No on Prop 6 tab, and then read a white paper that is very well researched by a bond attorney who knows a lot about water. And in the the legislation behind this, Prop 6, are the words, shall undertake to apply, 10% for rural, 20% for conservation. And there was a big debate on the floor of the House saying, where the legislators were saying, why does it just say, shall apply? What is the purpose of shall undertake to apply? I have a feeling y'all can figure that one out. Thank you. I think this one may have been answered somewhat by Representative Larson, how does it help Texas communities to go into debt to the state government rather than simply provide grants? Why loans and not grants? Who would like to answer that? Well, I think I've already answered it, I but I'd like, to, it. I'd like to address uh, the, some of uh, the issues that Linda brought up. Sure. And, you know, they're valid. And I, we've got uh, an issue where you've got a lot of competing interests for water in the state. You've got the rural folks that provide the food stock. Uh, you've got the population centers that need water uh, to survive and uh, to attract jobs. Uh, you've got the industrial base that needs to cool uh, uh, the uh, electric generators. So you've got to have water like we've got at Bronig and Calaveras that cools uh, the, the plant. So there's a lot of uh, competing interests. And in the energy sector to compound it, you've got a lot of folks south of us in the Eagleford that are using water for hydraulic fracking. And uh, so the stress nexus is what they call it. You've got folks uh, that you've got to have water to create power, and uh, the power is used uh, to, uh, uh, to bring water to the surface and to provide 
uh, all of the uses in the industrial and the ag and for the population centers of water. So it, it's, a, it's an historic battle. This has happened since the beginning of time where po folks will continue to focus on the limited resource that we have available and wars have been fought over water. Uh, the, the motive, uh, it's, uh, I don't believe that the motive of the legislature is the, in any way to usurp uh, the, the value of the money that was approved uh, by the voters in, pro in the proposition a couple of years ago. That is bond money that will be sold uh, it, on behalf of public utilities like the San Antonio Water System. They want to come in and access $100 million to help offset the cost of their desal plant, that's fine. This fund is offering low interest loans to folks that can't go out and secure the money on their own. Uh, Elsa, Raymondville, uh, Uvalde, all of these small 45 communities that have less than 180 days of water, they have to fix something. And so the state will loan them this money and allow them to go out and build their facilities or we defer a loan if it takes them three years to get that project uh, online, start creating revenue, the state will defer the loan to that point. But the reason we didn't offer grants versus loans is we wanted the corpus or, or the, uh, uh, the two billion dollars to, to be able to roll over and finance projects over the next 30 to 35 years. And uh, it, was, uh, it was very deliberate. Uh, the grant process, I think, would have brought some of the mischief Linda talked about, you know, where people would have gone in and, and, uh, and the folks would have been asking for favor. This is, uh, the, of the 500 projects that are on the state water plan, uh, we'll look at the emergency aspect of it, not just the, the issues uh, that Jennifer talked about, but if we're in an emergency situation, obviously they jump, uh, they jump over everyone else and the priority will go. And it will be uh, developed in coordination with TCEQ, emergency operations folks in the governor's office and uh, the folks that uh, the Water Development Board deem as a priority. So I, I, there is no conspiracy. I know that there, there, there's always you know, in government uh, uh, folks think that there's some kind of motive. The motive is we need to build some water projects or the state uh, will no longer be competitive with other states uh, for, uh, for a lot of the jobs uh, that uh, we're competing uh, right now with a number of states that have uh, an abundance of water. So that's the, that's the whole motive behind this. This isn't a conspiracy, it's called business as usual. Okay, and if you wanted to guard against, I actually do think that some of the smaller towns, could, we could have provided grants. I mean, some of these towns are just, I'm not saying values, because I don't know for sure, but, but some of the towns that are in a dire shape really could use just a grant. They're, they're tiny and they need that support. But, Representative Larson is correct, there's too much uh, malfeasance going on. And if you want to address that, you don't give Rick Perry a chance to pick and choose the winners through his hand-picked appointees. Three people that are paid now to be on that Texas Water Development Board. So um, what we're seeing here is, we're going to see, I believe, is some of the people who have the greatest ac ac access to getting loans and bar have the best access to capital and um, borrowing terms are getting the biggest breaks for potentially projects that have great opposition in the state. I think this is a very dangerous amendment and I hope you will vote against it. They I need to go back and do their homework. I would like to refrain from ad hominem <coughs> remarks, please. Let's just talk on a higher level. Yeah, but that that makes it years. interesting. <laughs> 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 Can you do that? Yeah, no, I'm just <laughs> Uh, anybody else want to address this? Well, I, I would like to, in a way, address this. Um, I want to recommend to all of the students here in the audience that you go home and Google the Texas Water Journal and read the account that is in their most recent issue. It's kind of a summary of what happened in the legislature with water. And the point I'd like to make that I took from that water journal is that, of course, the media and all of our attention is focused on 
Proposition 6 that we'll be voting on in November. But there are many other things that happened at the legislature regarding water that are affecting what's going to happen with who's given how much money from this Proposition 6. One of them is Bill um, HB 3605. It actually sets up a threshold for water loss in small and large water utilities. And it requires that water utilities be evaluated for their water conservation plan and make sure they're actually implementing it. And all those evaluations are actually going to be given to the legislature, too. So people are getting much more serious at the legislature and at TWDB about water conservation, about reuse, about making sure that you don't lose a lot in your lines. And those kind of things needed to be done for years before money was handed out. Now, those kind of things are going to be tied to how the Texas Water Development Board is going to evaluate projects that ask for money. So that's a point that I wanted you to know. Jennifer, did you have anything to allow? I mean, I think it's really all been said, but I, I would say obviously I love grants, I love free money. But I think in this case, I understand the point of, of really of keeping that principle intact. I mean, we are, I think we, we need to remember this is from the rainy day fund. And while I agree that this is a great use for it, I mean, if this is, if this is not an emergency, I don't know what is. At the same time, it is the rainy day fund, and so I think the idea of keeping that that you know that corpus there and not touching it is a good one because you know I have small children and I want that money to be there in 30 years because you know who knows what the next emergency will be hopefully by then all the water issues will be solved <laughs> one way or the other someone has asked what are some specific examples of projects in the state water plan specifically for San Antonio well They've got uh, probably the best record in the state and one of the best in, in the country for their reuse uh, operations. Uh, the, the, the Dos Rios uh, Wastewater Treatment Plant, uh, they recirculate more water uh, than, all, uh, than the other communities, uh, the large urban communities in the state on a percentage basis. And uh, they are looking at building a reuse uh, project to augment that. Uh, they also are looking at building a, uh, which ultimately could be a 35 MGD, million gallons a day desalination plant in the south side of the community. And they've looked at uh, accessing some of this fund, some of these funds on a stopgap measure uh, until the project gets developed and then pay the state back, roll the money back in uh, so other communities can use it. Um, and then communities around us, obviously there's a lot of them along the I-35 corridor uh, that have water shortage issues uh, as close as Comal County and up in, uh, uh, up in, in and around Waco. Uh, the LCRA Basin uh, are looking at building a off-channel reservoir uh, down along the coast to capture water that's running down the Colorado River instead of allowing to flow into the Gulf of Mexico where we lose all value outside of the flow requirements that they have in the bays and estuaries, uh, they're going to capture some of that water and, and mitigate some of the issues with the farmers down in the Garwood district. And uh, that project will be also uh, something that they'll look at. But And the 45 communities that, that have ran uh, are, are within 180 days of running out of water. There's, those are the key ones that I would uh, submit. Anybody else? What about the, um, the ASR? Is that one of y'all's? You want to answer this, Greg? No, it's not. It's already built. It's, so built. it's already done. It's not done. Done. Yeah, it is, however, the, uh, it's being added to. Yeah, it is. The ASR, uh, for if people that are not aware of what that vernacular is, it's aquifer storage and recovery. In lieu of building a surface water project where you lose 50 to 60 percent of the volume uh, to evaporation, people are, are, are storing water underground. Uh, and we've got about 5 billion acre feet of aquifer storage capacity in the state of Texas. We use uh, about 120,000 acre feet of that. San Antonio's got the largest ASR in the state at 100,000 acre feet. Kerrville's got one. They take river water and they store it. 
uh, under the city of Kerrville, about 3,000 acre feet, and the folks in El Paso, uh, they take the affluent uh, out of the wastewater treatment plant and they put it, uh, they put the affluent back in the ground uh, and then they pull it up uh, after, after about three years. Uh, the largest ASR in the country is in Las Vegas. They store 320,000 acre feet of water under Las Vegas. They take the winter allotment from Lake Mead. That is the future for, for Texas storage. And to go back to some of Linda's comments about going in and, and flooding property, uh, I absolutely agree with her. Instead of flooding property and taking it out, uh, taking it out of production into perpetuity, we need to store the water underground. 26 ASRs have been developed in Florida. They're building 15 more all along the East Coast, all along the West Coast. Nobody's building surface water projects. They're, they're putting the water underground and storing it so we don't have evaporation. I applaud the folks uh, with, uh, with the San Antonio Water System that are doing that. And we need to look at the hydrogeological features in the state of Texas and figure out uh, where areas are conducive to that and start creating a strategic water bank or a, a strategic water reserve and start putting the water in lieu of going into the Gulf of Mexico, start storing that water uh, like other states have done. And uh, so the technology's there, it's just the willingness and uh, sitting down and cooperating interregionally with, uh, with folks that could, uh, have a positive, uh, could have a positive influence for the future growth of the state. Evelyn, I'd like to mention that um, water running to the Gulf of Mexico is sometimes needed to keep the bays and estuaries alive, which I know um, he realizes as well. And that uh, ASR, I have to compliment uh, SAWS as well because that water that they have stored in the aquifer storage and recovery ASR project is equivalent or more than the Apple White Reservoir would have held. It's a very big deal. I just wanted to add um, that I totally agree that these projects you know, need a prioritization so that we don't run into a problem with projects that are wasting water. Um, my understanding is that reservoirs evaporate about 30% of the water. Is that correct? Like 50%. It's an it's excess of 50%. It'll be more than that this summer. 50% yeah, of the of, of the annual yield. It, so it, it, it depends on how hot it is. And where it's yeah. at, yeah. What I'm trying to share with you is that there is now competition for, you know, where these projects are going to be and what projects are going to be. And I don't believe that we're set up yet to, to have the right decisions made by the right people. So I don't have difference. I, I appreciate what uh, San Antonio is doing. It's not happening in most of the other parts of the state. Uh, we've got a lot of questions here, and somebody has suggested that we keep our answers a little shorter so they can get to more of them. In a recent interview, Luke Metzger of Environment Texas stated that the state water plan includes projected spending for water needs to support fracking. Would passage of Prop 6 facilitate more water for this controversial use? Anybody? Yeah, I'll address that. Um, you, you have to have a designation as a public utility uh, or a public entity to access the money. No private sector entity can access uh, the, uh, the Prop 6 money. So uh, there won't be uh, uh, the, the ability for oil companies to come in and, and secure water. Uh, uh, using this funding mechanism. It is a challenge though. I mean, obviously in the Eagleford, uh, we're not recycling as much water as we should. Uh, there's a lot of initiatives, a lot of new technologies, you know, from uh, filtration, a micro and nano filtration, uh, to, to using reverse osmosis or the membrane technology, flash technology to heat it, and, and then a combination of all of those to treat that water. Uh, some of the oil companies, the major ones have gone in uh, Marathon in Carnes County is, uh, they've got an initiative right now to treat a lot of their water up to 15 to 20 percent of the volume, uh, and more and more pressures can be put on through, uh, the, through both uh, legislative measures as well as just the right thing to do. So uh, that is a competing interest for the water, and, and we've got to be vigilant to, to do everything we can to encourage more recycling. I would just, I would say not directly because uh, the public entities 
but obviously the you know the oil companies are getting the water from somewhere. We do get we get phone calls about it. We have questions. We have a emergency use only where uh, people can come fill up tanks of water, 250, 500 gallons, and it's for our constituents who have wells who have run dry. And we did get calls from oil companies asking if they could fill tanks there. And we said no, that, that's really yeah. not what that's for. That's for our, that's for homeowners who need that for actual for for their use. So, I mean, I think indirectly it could happen, but I don't think that's the focus of this proposition or how the money is, is, is aimed. Just a real quick question. Why is Exxon and Mobil supporting Prop 6? Uh, it's for the refineries. About 11% of the gasoline that uh, is brought into the United States or that's actually refined is in Port Arthur, Texas. In the drought of 2011, uh, the, the water that cools those plants comes out of Sam Rayburn. Uh, they had less than 18 months of supply left. Their electro, hydroelectric capacity in both Sam Rayburn and Toledo Bend were compromised. Uh, they're looking at uh, building a pipeline from the Sabine River uh, over into the Lower Natchez uh, River Authority and putting the water in the canals to have a backup plan to make sure that uh, those plants can be cooled uh, because their, uh, their capacity was definitely in jeopardy in the drought of 2011. And you look at the lake levels uh, in, in East Texas, they've replenished, but they're vulnerable to the same thing that the balance of the state is. So uh, they support it for job creation and economic development, and they've got uh, refineries uh, in Port Arthur and in the Houston area that has to have water to continue to provide jobs and gasoline uh, for, the, uh, for the state and the United States. I have a question for you, Ms. Garver. Oh. Okay. What projects are you planning for Uvalde? Do they curtail ag supplies? Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of control <coughs> over ag supplies. Most of them own their own water, and actually a lot of them own more water than we own as a city. Um, so, but we definitely, we do have a lot of partnership with uh, AgriLife. I always call it the Extension Center. It's Texas AgriLife now. So we actually lease them a lot of land where they do a lot of research. And then project-wise, we have we are looking for additional water supplies, both in the form of Edwards permits or Edwards leases. And we are also working very hard on secondary source water. And so we are looking to uh, refit one of our Edwards wells as a buta well. So we are actively pursuing, you know, and then we're, we are also have, have used a lot of SAW's help, actually, and have begun doing conservation projects in Uvalde, really piggybacking off some of their contracts, as well as just you know, bending their ear about how, how should we do this project and what, what would save water, what ideas do you have. And we're about to enter into a big um, project with the Edwards Aquifer Authority through their Habitat Conservation Program. We're going to have some funding for additional low flow toilets, industrial commercial retrofits, and those types of things. Thanks. Someone is asking, why only projects from the water plan? Who made the water plan and how are they selected? <laughs> and I'm going to ask Diane this question. Yeah, well, the water plan is made up by representatives from every community and all kinds of industries and ag who all get together in a big room once every quarter at least, if not more often, for five years at a time to sort through the needs of each community. They ask each community or industry, what do you need? What do you project you're gonna need in the next 20 years? And then they look at supplies and what the future supply plans might be. And in the past, the regional planning groups like Regionale have um, had long lists of sometimes duplicative projects, projects that everybody knew not all the projects would actually be built. But they were just in there because in order to build the project, you've got to really be in the plan. This year, the legislature is saying, if you want funding from this Proposition 6 money, you're going to have to be a priority in the regional plan. And so the regional planning group is going to have really fascinating meetings and you must start coming to them because they will be discussing who is the highest priority on this long, long list of projects. And believe me, it is not going to be easy to come to agreement among all the varied interests. It may not be pretty either. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I would first just Google the website 
uh, Region L. You, you can go the long name, South Central Texas Water Planning Group, if you want to, but Region L will get it. Uh, the website does take a while to load, so be patient. And uh, the meetings will be on that website. There's one coming up in November, I believe. It's always the first Thursday of the month when the meeting is held. So, and it's usually quarterly until as we start, or we used to, when we got down to, you know, having to come up with the next plan, then you started having more meetings. And 2015 is the next plan, right? Well, this one was 2012, so okay. it'll be five years from there. So. And Evelyn did this on Region L for 12 years? 15. 15 years, so I'm the newbie, but we really appreciate her service. <laughs> Here's someone who is asking, will Propos Proposition 6 protect Bracken Cave since the Edwards Aquifer is underneath it? I don't think Proposition 6 is going to have much to do with Bracken Cave. I think it's mainly a funding mechanism, isn't it? So we have I don't know of a water project planned for Bracken Cave. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Thank you. If all of the funding, both at the state and local level, comes from taxpayers, what is the reasoning behind charging interest on the loans? The issue uh, is that uh, on the rainy day fund, we get uh, less than 1% return on that money. Uh, it's going to be at $8.5 billion uh, at the end of this biennium. The concept in, in creating it was if we had a catastrophic hurricane uh, that hit the coastline, uh, that we should put away about 5% of our general fund, which is about $97 billion uh, in this budget. Uh, you would use somewhere between five and six billion held as a reserve. Uh, the prolific growth in the oil and gas industry, that is the generator that creates this fund uh, with all the shell plays, not only in Eagleford, but about in the Permian Basin, up in the Barnett Shell and the Haynesville that comes in out of Louisiana and Arkansas, we could have never anticipated the growth of this fund. The fund rolls over into the general fund uh, uh, once it hits a cap. And so uh, of taking this money and using it and investing it back into water projects and not granting the money but investing it back would give us a similar return at 1%, but you had communities that could actually access it and use it. So we're actually fostering growth of water projects. So that's, uh, that was the, 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 uh, the mindset on how this was established. Anybody else? Well, administration costs as well. Yeah. Could somebody? Sure. I.e. Representative Larson, <laughs> it's to me why uh, the $6 billion hasn't been used in the revolving bank fund for water that we, that we voted on in 2011 and why this one is needed now. They've uh, finished up using the balance of the fund prior to the $6 billion being authorized by the voters. And uh, this fund will be a supplement to that. So if you've got a large water project, uh, you want to access some bond money, uh, you don't have uh, the same uh, credit that the folks uh, that have at the state. You have a, 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 an A rating, a double A rating, but you can get a triple A rating. You can get less money using that bond money. And if you want to develop a project out, you can use deferred money under this plan, under Prop 6 money, or get a low interest loan. Uh, but you can do a combination of that and whatever your bonding capacity is at the local level. So it's an aggregated approach. Anybody else? I think we have time for one more if everybody wants to answer it. What does it mean to Texas if Prop 6 does not pass? And, or conversely, what does it mean to Texas if it does pass? Let's talk about if it doesn't pass. What do you think, Diane? If it doesn't pass, um, I think that we are going to be somewhat behind in serving many communities with water projects. And I actually think that we will have lost some of the steps forward that this bill made about prioritizing projects, about setting up thresholds for water losses that communities have to abide by, um, 
you know, water conservation, all of the advances that were made hard fought in the legislature uh, might be lost and might not happen with the next session again. Uh, if it doesn't pass, we'll just see that the development of water projects during the state water plan, uh, plan wane. Uh, they won't uh, be developed as quickly, and, and it will compromise our ability to attract jobs in the state and develop water resources for our population centers, our industrial base, and ultimately, I think, have an adverse impact on our economy. Thank you. I think you'll continue to see a greater divide between the rural and the metropolitan areas to a point that some the rural areas will begin to shrink and fade away. And be, because and you notice that list of the 45 days, you didn't hear any major metropolitan areas that were on that. So I, I think that's the real loss, and that's part of what makes Texas Texas. I mean, that's when people think of wide open spaces and cowboys, they're thinking of rural Texas. If you go read our white paper at independenttexans.com, you'll see a cowboy roving a fire hydrant on the front, and it says, Stop the Rural Urban Water Wars. I think if we vote Prop 6 down, the legislature is going to have to stop dividing rural and urban and figure out how we're going to conserve our, our aquifers and how we're going to serve the little towns that are running out of water first instead of the people with big money and big sway to get their hands on the rainy day funds now. Don't forget, there's $6 billion in a revolving bank fund we already passed, so there is money there. I want to thank everyone for coming, and I hope you learned a little bit of something, and we'll vote on November the 5th in the constitutional amendment election. And I want to thank Comcast, Nowcast's essay, for their, all their help and all broadcasting this. We have brochures for Nowcast in the back. All right. Did you have something you wanted to say? No. No. I said all right. No, I thank the panelists. And Thanks. Thank you. I'm so glad you were here. We're going to meet you in region now. Oh, I, I already miss it. Oh, do you? Oh, yes. I loved it. I'm so glad you were here. It was good to have somebody who was...